Good morning, good morning. Welcome to church, everybody. How you doing? Good to see you. We are going to start today. Today's actually a special day. Uh, We're going to celebrate that uh, Pastor Charlie, 20 years ago on this day, April 7th, was ordained a pastor here. And uh, Pastor Charlie Gailey had been serving here and pastoring and loving for 20 years here at Joy Church. And there to be honored. Would you guys come up this morning? <clears throat> come on up. I love it. You guys have been here uh, a long time. When you came, I was just a little kid. I was probably, what, 12? 10 years old. No way. I love it. Uh, and uh, and you, they have been serving. If you have not had the privilege of meeting Pastor Charlie Gailey, here they are. They're the most wonderful people that we have in this community. You guys have loved well. You've served well. Uh, and you have done an incredible job. Today's the actual day that we mark 20 years of you serving in pastoral care, pastoral ministry at this church. And I can tell you, each and every one of our lives have been affected and changed for the better, haven't they? And uh, we're so thankful. I know that you have, uh, sometimes people ask the question, well, Ben, uh, if you're the, if you're pastor of the church. Who's your pastor? Well, I'd like you to meet them. They're right here. These are, this is my pastors and I love them. They've loved us well. Would you bring that up? We have a gift for you guys. Yeah. Yay. The, um, they're awesome. Uh, I love this. We, you're going to make me up here. It's heavier. It's too heavy, huh? I love this. <laughs> The gift's for her, Charlie. It's for her. Yeah. We, uh, I want to I read this. We end up, we, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this out here. That's for me. Jeez. Okay. Come on. Calm down. Uh, we end up getting a, an award for 20 years of service, and I want to read this to you. This is, this is for all that you two have poured out, for all those lives that you've touched, and for the kindness and love that you've generously given to this family and the family of God day after day, year after year. We want to say thank you. Your faithfulness to this house is abounding, and we appreciate you, and we honor you, your service, and your heart for the people of Joy Church. We love you, and we say thank you for serving this house. Whoa. I I still have a quick reaction. I know. That was good. I like that. Um, If you want to set that down. Are you... Is it too heavy? Okay. I love it. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I love this. Um, I know, we, we love you guys, and each and every one of our lives have been touched in so many ways. Don't we love them? And uh, what we want to do is I want to pray. I want to pray over you, pray a blessing over you. Don't worry. They're not going anywhere. This isn't retirement. This isn't, they're not leaving or moving. Uh, we just want to celebrate the 20 years that they've been here serving and loving God, that you, you two are a gift to us. 20 years ago, well, actually, you showed up more than that, uh, but um, you have been a gift to this house and to this church, and I appreciate you, and we love you. We want to honor you in all we do. So let's pray for them. Lord, thank you. Thank you. For, um, for good leaders, good shepherds, people to look after us and look after our soul. Thank you for every seed sown, every dollar given, every phone call, every meal, every time that they've showed up in the middle of all of our chaos and our, our, our hard times, Lord. Thank you for, for raising up pastors, people to love us and lead us. And, and we just pray a blessing, Lord. Your, your word says that as, that you refresh, as we refresh others, you'll refresh us. And so we pray for a refreshing over their life, just a blessing over them. Lord, we pray the prayer that uh, Moses prayed over the, the tribe of Asher, where he says, so your years, so shall your strength be. And so we just pray over them. You keep them strong and healthy. Uh, thank you, Lord, for giving them as a gift to the body of Christ here in Central Oregon and here at Joy Church and here to us. Lord, thank Thank you for loving us by sending us Charlie and Gailey. And we just pray a blessing on their lives. And uh, thank you for the 20 years that they've given this house and continue to give and lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel. I pray fruit, fruit would be abundant in their home. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. 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 Love you. We love you guys. Um, if, you do not, if you've never had the privilege of meeting them, you need to say hello to them. They're the most wonderful people in the world. I actually, uh, I'm honored because for years, you guys served my dad. Seven years ago, uh, my dad and I transitioned in ministry. Dad retired, still here, still preaches. And, uh, and we, I, ended up, I ended up stepping into to that role. And I actually asked Charlie, I said, Charlie, I don't know what the call of God is on your life. I know you served my dad faithfully. Um, I said, I don't assume that it's to serve me as well. And so I just said, I want to know, like, what, like, I, I release you if, if this is the time that you need to step back. And he said, no, he says, I'm called to this house. He says, I'll serve you as I served your father. And what, what a humbling, humbling, uh, man, what character you guys have and quality that you have and you've loved us well. And so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're to be honored here. 
We love you very, very much. So welcome to church. We're so glad that you guys are here. We're actually stepping into a brand new season. Let it grow. No, this is not a marijuana pun. So <laughs> just have to come out the gates and say that so that you guys all know. Uh, this, is, this is about springtime and new life and what the Lord wants to do in and through the lives of his people. Um, I really believe that he wants to plant his word in our hearts and he wants to let it grow. And so that's what we're hoping, that's what we're praying about, that's what we're going to be focusing on during the season. Uh, it is pretty cool to see all the movement around the property, isn't it? See everything that's changing. Uh, maybe if this is your first time, our intention was not a dirt parking lot and a gravel pit, not the intention from the beginning. We're actually building uh, more space and more parking, getting ready for a new building. And uh, it's exciting to see all that happened through the winter and all that's taking place. Our new uh, south lot or upper lot is open. If you've never seen it, you can drive down. There's another entrance on this side, and there's a whole other lot in the back, and it's beautiful. Want to go up there? It's a nice little walk into church. It is closer to the new building than it is to this building, uh, but it's really cool to see all that's happening, all that's taking place. What you're going to see in the next month uh, or a couple months is we're getting ready to bring in our utilities, so we're going to be doing some big ditches, bringing in utilities. We'll build a few outer buildings. There's going to be one in the back. There'll be a garage in the front for all of our maintenance, supplies, stuff like that, so you're going to see all those things start to take shape, uh, and what we're doing as a church is over the next couple months going to wrap up the frame of the property so we can start landscaping, uh, and we are currently fundraising for a new building. Everything that you see, uh, someone went before you and fundraised, and we've saved out of our general funds. We've done everything we can to pay for everything that you see at Debt Free. So how cool is that? That's amazing to see everybody's generosity. <clears throat> This is how the Lord desires to build his house as he wants to use us. And so we're giving, giving sacrificially. And what we've done is everything you're doing is debt free. We're currently now in a, in a courageous campaign to fundraise for, to build a new building. And so we'll give more information on that in the coming months, but it's just exciting to see all that the Lord's doing. I love the movement. Yes, there are days where you show up and there's mud puddles and kids are going home dirty and cars are, are being washed away, whatever's happening. Uh, but hang in there. We're working on it and it's looking good. And we appreciate everybody who's spending time out there sacrifice and giving their lives to do that. So uh, we will be doing a, a worship prayer property walk. That's important because we really believe that we want to pray in, you know, his kingdom uh, come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God desires, he's desiring to do a great work in this place. And so we are going to go and prepare the way for those who are yet to come. And so I want to encourage you to be a part, be attentive to what's going on as we launch back in at the end of May, talk about courageous campaign and, and, and giving for those who have yet to come. Lock in, ask the Lord what we have me to do. And we as a church are growing and we are actually growing closer to the Lord in all of these things as well. So today we launch our new series, Let It Grow. The hope of this series really uh, is that the gospel, the word of God, would take root in each and every one of our lives. That there would be a good soil for it to actually take root and to produce a fruit. That the areas in your life that are dry, that are hard, that, are, that, are, that, that feel like there's no movement, there's no breakthrough, that the Lord would actually bring new life. He would break those things, break unbelief, and break pain, and break your past experience. And he would come into those areas that you say, God, I don't want you here. He actually wants to go there. And he wants to break some of those things off of you and not just bring new life. He wants your life to explode with fruit from his word. And so he wants to do the good things in you. That we do believe wholeheartedly that before the Lord can do something through you, he has to do something in you. And so this is our cry, cry of our heart. Lord, would you let your word grow? Let it grow in our heart. We're going to be uh, walking through this, this series today. You're going to get it. You're going you're to start history class. You're going to move to science class. And then we're going to finish at church. So if you came looking for an education today, welcome. You're going to history and science and Bible all in one. So I look, I look forward to that and I uh, really feel like the Lord has a, a good plan. You're here on purpose. The Lord brought you here today for a reason. And uh, he wants to do something in you, even right now in this service. Just allow him. God, would you, would you produce in me something? Would you, would you allow my heart to be soil for your word to actually take root and to grow? Back in the Early 1700s, none of us were around, uh, feels like forever ago, but in the early 1700s, what you had in the landscape of the earth is, is um, Britain had sent over massive amount of people, actually thousands of people, and right at the beginning of the 1700s, you have all 13 colonies that are established, British colonies, before it was America, uh, you have 13 British colonies that were now officially established for Britain, and uh, and 
Every, they, they had sent out thousands and thousands of people. In fact, what happened in the landscape of Britain is all of these young, strong, hopeful people, anyone who had energy and drive was like, I'm going to go to a new world, I'm, I'm going to go start something new, and I'm going to get out of Britain. There was a mass exodus, and so the people who stayed in Britain were the ones that either had a large amount of money, they had no reason to leave, or they were thinking, hey, I have no hope, I'm here anyway, nothing's ever going to change in my life, therefore why? Why would I put any energy into it? So you have this interesting thing happened in the nation where all of the young and hopeful people left the nation and the people that were there were the ones that were either had no hope or were completely stuck to the land or stuck to their family and couldn't leave. And they actually say that during this time, this nation of Britain had experienced a long season of, of peace. There was no wars. There wasn't anything going on. And they just actually started as a nation getting what they would call lazy and apathetic. Uh, they started to get pride and arrogant, ungrateful, and actually this season of Britain's life, they were known as a very sinful nation. They were a nation that was no longer in need of God. Nobody wanted him and nobody needed him. In fact, uh, there was different people in the nation at the time, early 1700s, and it started, to really, it started to really mess with their hearts. Those who had a relationship with the Lord were looking around and saying, there's sin everywhere. In fact, there's this one person, her name's Lady Huntington. She ends up having a connection with George Whitfield, who was, a, who was known, come, come later to be known as a, a very famous preacher, actually. And uh, she had a meeting with him, and she was in conversation, and she says this in reference to the, the city of Bath, which is, in, which is in Britain, if you've ever been there. It's an absolute beautiful city. But she went and she visited, and she's in a conversation with George Whitfield. She says this, My friends and I returned from Bath because my doctor advised me to take some waters of Bath. But the city itself is enough to make me sick all over again. In my opinion, it's a silly playground for the rich. The most stupid place I've ever seen. Endless entertainment and drinking and gambling. Vanity of vanities. It's the worst of them all. She says, what pride the rich have, Mr. Whitfield. I am quite out of patience with all of the wickedness of them all. She recognized she's living in a day in which the nation that she'd grown to love and she'd grown up in and, and her life was in and she raised her kids in and had a family and was all of a sudden going the way of the world. Nobody wanted God. Nobody cared about God. Nobody had a need for God. And it was just this, I love how she even communicated a stupid playground for the rich. Man, when I read that, I see so many different similarities to the nation that we live in today. In fact, it was known that she said later in her conversation with him, she said that somebody could come and spend an entire month just soaking up entertainment and self and pleasure, only to a month later step out and say, what did I miss? They'd so overindulged themselves. In fact, this conversation he's having with George Whitfield, who was a preacher, he was, uh, felt the call of the Lord, started preaching, and uh, he actually took a ship, went over to the colonies, the British colonies, and he started preaching through the British colonies. And a lot of people were getting saved, and there was a great movement of the Lord happening in the British colonies. Yet he would come back to, to Britain, and he would see no movement in the churches in Britain. And she had this conversation with him. In fact, as she's talking to him, he tells her, my new station in life will be to go to America. That's my best scene of action. That's where I'm going to stay. And she actually begged him. Don't forget about the church here. She said, God wants to reawaken the church here. It's not just about what you're going to go to. She says, don't forget about where you came from. God has a desire for this. And in fact, there was a desire that started bubbling in her heart over and over again. And, and she started actually asking different preachers, don't just leave and go to America, come back and reawaken the church here. There was something in, in, in her spirit that kept saying, would you just not forget us? She knew that her desperation came out of the fact that when she looked at the culture around her, it was completely sinful and wicked. Despite having the fact that the Church of England at the time had over 10,000 churches in every town and city and village. In fact, the common church at that time was known as stale and lifeless. And history books say that during that time, the church had fallen asleep. And George Whitfield chose to respond to her call. And he said, I will go to America. He says, but I will continue to come back. And in fact, he split his time between both. And he continued to preach. And when he preached in England, he preached about reawakening and opening up our eyes and letting the Lord do something amazing. And uh, not only did he hear her cry, several other people heard her cry. And the Lord heard her cry. For the church to arise 
and to be reawakened and reestablished. And so over the next 20 to 30 years of history, what you see is the Lord raised, rose up people to start reawakening the church. In fact, they would, there was a time where they said, you know, I went to 97 churches and I estimate that only two or three of them actually care or preach the gospel. And so men and women started saying, I'll take my place and I will jump in. And it was beautiful to see the Lord started raising up. This is where you hear of, uh, you know, I would say famous people that a lot of you guys would know in history books, John Thornton, John and Charles Wesley that started traveling throughout the entire era on house, uh, horseback and started preaching, John Newton, John Edwards, four Johns. Can you imagine? Four Johns. The Lord raised up all the Johns in the nation of Britain. That's what he did. Uh, now we're in the area of the Joshes. So the Joshes are the ones that we're getting <laughs> in plethora. They're just everywhere, Joshes. Uh, and so that was a John era. This is a Josh era. That's what we've determined. Uh, George Whitfield, Lady Huntington, just all, a ton of really famous names, famous people who chose to not just forsake their own in their own home, but to actually say, I'm going to stay here, I'm going to go in between, and I'm going to preach until something happens. That's what I'm going to do. Until something happens, I'm going to continue to preach. George Whitfield said this uh, in one of his sermons while he was in Britain. He said, there are great and many who bear the name of Christ, and speaking about the church in England, but do not know what real Christianity is. He says, I'm persuaded that the majority of preachers uh, talk is of an unknown and unfelt Christ. The only way that we're going to restore the church and bring dignity back to it is to live and to preach the doctrine of Christ. When you have once tasted his love and have felt the power of his grace upon your hearts, you will then love to talk about Jesus. And I, I just so appreciate his heart where he recognizes it's not about preaching a good message. It's about connecting what we live and what we say together. So if we can just get people to preach and to live the same thing, all of a sudden there would be an awakening that happens in the people and you would see that the church would arise. And so what we see over a 20 or 30 year period is that men and women would get up and it was, they were known for opening up their Bible. I love this. And they preach simple, clear, and powerful messages. They simplified the gospel. They made it clear to the person who could hear it, whether you were a dignitary or whether you were a peasant. They made the gospel clear. And there was a call. That what happened, what changed was the people preaching, they actually started to preach from the inside of them instead of preaching something that they knew about. They started to preach something that they knew. And they started to fall in love with Jesus. And so we see thousands of people started getting saved in the Americas, but then also in Great Britain, you saw all of these people started becoming hungry for the Lord again. And there was something that was being reawakened in the church. And they said that all of a sudden they would run out of space in the churches and they'd have to move outside or move to a field or move to a farm. They'd move to a theater and they started taking on other places because more and more people were showing up and they said, our churches don't have enough room anymore. And the Lord started impressing on people's um, uh, on, on their hearts and on their lives. What I love is they used to have these house parties where these dignitaries would actually throw a party because they recognized some of the, the affluent people aren't going to show up and walk down into the mud with all the rest of the people. And so they said, how about we have a house party? And they would have these parties with all of their friends over. They would leverage every single relationship they had. And then they would go to a George Whitfield or a, or a John Thornton or a John Newton. And they would say, would you come and would you preach to my friends? Would you preach to my friends? And they were like, yeah, we'll do that too. And so they were going from field to church to theater to houses. And they continued to preach. And the goal of what we saw happening was this just awakening and reawakening of the church. This is what we know in history as the first great awakening. When God reawakened his people, reawakened the church, George Whitfield was known for preaching over 18,000 messages to over 10 million people. Like he gave his life. In fact, when he died, he told his wife, she says, you're too sick to go in to preach. And he says, I'm going to go preach one more time and then I'll die. <laughs> he says, he told her, he says, I am weary in the work, but not of the work. So he rode on horseback there. He preached a message to thousands of people. And on his way home, he had a coughing fit and died before he could get back. That was his last message. 18,000 times he preached. And the goal every time he's preached was to reawaken the church back to what it should be, to reawaken and create a heart and a soil for his word to take root. In fact, John Reinhardt says this, 
towards the end of this great awakening, he says, the Church of England, which had long been barren of gospel fruit, had now exploded with buds and blossoms and many branches. The gospel took root in a people that was once dead, what was completely dead and barren, and everybody looked back and said, they're a forsaken country, let's leave and let's get out of here. God came back in and he reawakened his church. And he reawakened to a place where all of a sudden what happened in Britain, the Great Awakening, transferred back over the pond and you see a second Great Awakening that now blessed all of what we live in today. What once was dead, he had chose to bring back to life. And I believe in my heart that God desires to do that again. I believe he desires to do it for us in our country, in our nation. When we step back and we would see all these things that are so God forsaken, we've given up and lost hope on certain things around us. But God, in his good grace, desires to reawaken our hearts. And I believe wholeheartedly that God is going to reawaken the hearts of individuals and we are going to bear much fruit that the word of God will be planted and take root in the people of God. And then all of a sudden, what we're going to see is a move of God that explodes all over this wonderful, wonderful place. It's my desire through this series, but even in my lifetime, to see the word of God take root in each and every one of our hearts and then bring life. So for me, the simple cry of let it grow is, Lord, would your, would your word grow in my heart? Would my heart be a place that would receive the good news, that would receive your word, and would it grow and would it find fruit here in my life? The question that we are going to look at through this series is really, what does it look like to have a heart that is prepared and ready for his word to plant seed, to see fruit so that we can bear fruit? Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives this parable. A parable is a story, to, as a natural story to illustrate a spiritual point. He gives a story about a farmer who went and scattered seed. And if you've heard this before, he gives four conditions of what we know as the heart. As he scatters seed, the seed fell on the footpath, on the shallow soil, on thorns, and on fertile soil. He goes through to explain exactly what that means and, and what it looks like for someone who, who it falls on the shallow path. It's somebody who just doesn't understand it. All of a sudden, the word of God or the, the understanding or the truth of God is spoken but you're thinking, I didn't get it. I don't know what you're saying. That word never took root, never had a place to, to find root. And the shallow soil is one who, who leaves and says, that was a great message. That was so great. And then they walk out, but there's no root system. There's no place for it to sit or settle in their life. There's no way for them to actually put it into action or to move forward. Therefore, the word of God doesn't produce. The next one are the thorns, where he just says that the word of God goes in, and we try so hard to let it produce something in our life and to create this soil. What happens is the thorns, the, the things in life, and I love this, he actually even says, it's the worries of life and the lure of wealth. Oh, I would love to, but I'm busy next weekend. Oh, I would love to, but I can't make that happen. Oh, man, I, I'm busy working, trying to make extra. I'm trying to do this. And it's, this, it's the fact that we're so busy. And when we look at our calendars, you would say, I would love to do more. I would love to invest. I would love to do things that are spiritual. But the reality is, I just don't have any time. I'm too busy at work. I'm too busy with my family. I'm too busy with my job. I'm too busy with all of the things I have. And those things choke out the word of God. Therefore, the word of God never produces. But the goal, really, is that we would have fertile soil, in each and every one of our lives. In fact, it says those who truly hear and understand, it goes into their life and it will produce 60 and 100 fold in each and every one of you. Our hope, my hope, is that when the word of God is planted and when it is read and when it is spoken, that it would actually find a place to rest and to bear fruit in our, my life. And that's the hope for this sermon series is to, to take it from that standpoint instead of saying, hey, how do we make good, how do we not have uh, shallow soil or thorns? I just want to know, tell me how to get fertile soil. Tell me how to create a place in my life in which his word can be planted and can produce fruit. I want to know. I just want to know how it all works. And I want to know how would I be one that prepares a place for his presence and for his seed. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to take a natural concept, and we're going to overlay it over a spiritual principle. Why? Because the heavens declare the glory of God. Everything he's created in the natural illustrates a spiritual point. This is the beauty of having the creator also the one who wrote and inspired the Bible. 
is that everything that we read spiritually, there's a natural thing that happens in our life in which we can see the natural overlaid over the spiritual, and it actually brings a depth and a new meaning and a new purpose to everything that we do. So here's what we're doing is we're actually going to walk through the process of seed germination through this in a four-week series. This is how seed, this is how a seed is germinated. And we're going to overlay it over a spiritual principle. As you can see here on the screen, you have a seed. From that seed comes a single root. From the root is established a root system. And now all of a sudden starts to grow towards the sun or grow towards the surface. And then once it is a healthy and mature plant, something happens in that that actually causes it to make a real difference. The four stages that you see here as defined in a natural way in science class, because now we're out of history class into science class, everybody, is this. There's a four-part series called imbibition. I said that correctly, just so you know. It's not inhibition. Imbibition, spelled correctly. For everybody who's going to Google search and fact check, I'm right. So go ahead. <laughs> Please take your time. Grab your phone and fact check me. I got that one. Imbibition, which we'll explain today, a healthy root system is created. Then you have photomorphogenesis and photosynthesis. These are, these are process, I know. Someone who's like, finally, a science term is used in church, you know? Finally, somebody brought a real class into church. Photomorphogenesis is amazing. It's actually how a plant responds to sunlight. And photosynthesis is how a plant takes the crap around it and converts it into something called life. And so we are, did it, I can't say crap. Bad air, bad air. There we go. It's when bad air turns to good air. So whatever. You guys haven't been in science class for years. You don't know these things. Uh, this is the process by which a plant grows, and it has to walk through this process in order to produce fruit. So today we look at the first one, which is imbibition. I'm going to explain this to you. Imbibition is once a seed is planted into a healthy, moist soil, it starts to soak up the surrounding water. And as it soaks up the surrounding water, it starts to expand on the inside and it starts to grow on the inside. As soon as that growth on the inside builds up enough pressure, it breaks the outer layer, the hard shell and the outer layer and exposes a single root. This is a beautiful natural principle when you see it. This is what God wants to do in your life today. He wants to do it in this next season and he wants to do it in the next couple of weeks into your life. He actually so wants to fill up your heart with him an imbibition that all of a sudden something happens on the inside. It activates in a plant enzymes that all of a sudden start to grow on the inside. And when you can take like a lima bean, you take a bean, you can't bite the hard shell with your teeth. But yet God all of a sudden lets that thing soak up all the water and on the inside starts to grow and expand and create pressure. And once the pressure is so great, all of a sudden it snaps and breaks free from the outer shell layer and exposes a single root that can now take place in root. Spiritually, what we find is that we have an interior heart in which God so wants to fill he so wants to abide in, and he so wants us to soak him up. But what we find is the moment that God starts to do something in our life, we find that we have these areas of unbelief, these areas of doubt, these areas of life experience where we're like, I know God is good, but I'm just not experiencing it. The moment you see someone and you see someone get healed, and then you turn around and you think to yourself, but like, but was that really him? Are you sure? Did that really happen? Like we have these areas in our life in which we recognize that they don't exactly line up with scripture. Scripture says one thing and what we experience is another. And so we ask this question, well, which one is right? Well, the reality is, is that his word is right. Truth is right. But our experience, our life is not, is not feeling that. And there are areas that we hold on to of unbelief. There's areas of hardness. When you step back and look at it, we can go through different seasons of life where we step back and we say, I feel like just hardened. I don't know if you've ever walked through one of those seasons. I remember saying that to Rachel uh, several years back, saying, I feel like my, 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 my heart is just hard. I feel like I'm watching all of these things around me, but nothing's getting in. Nothing's like, like in here. And to ask this question, then how do we, how do we break that? How do we get through doubt? How do we get through this series of unbelief? How do, we, how do we reconcile our life experiences with his word and his truth? Because in our lives, I'll be honest with you, they don't always match up. We used to do a class here called 
identity. And uh, it was a freedom class. And at the beginning of it, we would actually start by kind of creating this dissonance and, and creating the, this issue where we'd bring up a scripture. So I know that I know the Bible says that he will meet all my needs according to his riches and glory in Philippians 4. But when I step back and look at it, I just live in so much need. His Bible says, the Bible says that, that he'll supply all my needs according to his riches and glories. But I'm sitting here going, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. There's something in me that's this hard outer shell that I recognize. I'm not breaking through. Like, although I can see truth, I'm not living that truth. And what he wants to do is actually get you to a place where he can break that stuff off of you. Uh, Jeremiah 33, the Lord's speaking to his people, and he says, I will bring health and I will bring healing to them. I will heal and my people and let them enjoy an abundant peace and security. Yet we step back and ask, sometimes you go, but but I can't even sleep at night. But I'm struggling to find peace. But I don't feel like I have security. I feel like everything I have is just falling apart. And what we find is that when the truth of God is revealed, sometimes we have this hard outer layer shell on our heart that says, oh, wouldn't that be nice? I don't know if you've ever said that. Somebody else got a miracle, got a provision, got healing, and we just sit back and we look at God and say, well, wouldn't that be nice if you chose to do that for me? The question, really, is how do we break through that hard shell? How do we break through the shell of unbelief, break through the shell in our hearts of, of really even our past experiences? The reality is, and the natural progression is the same as the spiritual progression, we got to soak that thing in truth. This isn't a name it and claim it series where it's like, here's the Bible verse, and I'm just going to claim this over my life. No, this is, this is an expose it and soak it in truth series. Expose the doubt, expose the, expose the unbelief, expose the area in which you're like, God, I'm struggling to even care. I'm struggling to forgive. I'm struggling with anger towards others and towards you to expose that one and then set that thing in truth and just let it soak for a little while. Because what he wants to do is he wants to take the unbelief and he wants to take the anger and he wants to take the doubt and not just all of a sudden be like, boom, you're free, woo-hoo. He wants you to soak in it. And we're going to soak it in truth until all of a sudden our heart starts to build pressure upon our circumstance. And then there's a great breaking and breakthrough. I think that there are things in your life that you've been praying for and breakthrough that you've been hoping for. And in and through this series, if you can simply understand imbibition and just soak in his presence and soak in his word and soak with his people, you're going to get breakthrough that you already stopped praying for years ago. I really believe it. I really believe that as a people, if we, just, if we can just sit in him for a little bit, if we can up our consumption of him and we can just sit our frustrations and anger and doubt and unbelief in truth, I guarantee you, based off a natural principle and a very much spiritual principle, he's going to bring breakthrough in your life. And it's everything you need, and it will expose a single root that we'll deal with next week. Imbibition is a lost art form. In fact, most of history, we used to use it uh, in, in building and actually in the splitting of rocks. What's cool, I have a photo here. And this is how people used to split rocks in the past before the big jackhammers. Like you see the ones we have out on the property that are just, we get to enjoy throughout the week. The thunk, 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 thunk. Yeah. Before that, uh, they used to split rocks in this way. In fact, what they would do is they would take a rock and they would cut these little, little edges all the way around where they wanted the rock to, to be split. They would take sticks and they would shove the sticks in with a hammer and they'd shove the sticks in all around the rock and then they would soak the sticks with water. And they didn't do it one time. They would come back and they kept soaking the sticks. They wouldn't soak the whole rock in water. They would soak the sticks in water. And those sticks would continue to like soak up water. And in fact, what happened on the inside of those was something called imbibition, where the pressure on the inside of soaking up all of the water around it started to build this serious pressure until one day they would walk out and the entire rock was split. You want to know how they got stairs and cornerstones and house stones for thousands of years? They used sticks and water. That's what they used. The art of imbibition, the reality is you don't have to break the whole rock. All you have to do is find a crevice in it and let it soak. And if we can recognize that there are areas in our life that are stone, that are hard, that there's anger and bitterness and that there's frustration and doubt and unbelief, we don't have to deal with the whole thing. 
The hope is not, we're not sitting here hoping and waiting for like one tool that's just gonna perfectly break all the doubt in your life. What he's hoping for is that we can expose it, we would dig a little hole, we would shove truth in, and then we would just soak it. And we'd let it soak, and we'd let it soak, and we'd let it soak. And day after day, several times a day, we would just put ourselves in a place of presence, put ourselves in a place of word. And if you do that, you're gonna get breakthrough in some of the hardest areas of your life. That maybe you've been praying for breakthrough for years. Maybe what you've been praying for for 20 years, 15 years, the Lord wants to actually come and bring breakthrough in this season and in and through this series. My encouragement for you is that you would up your consumption, that you would start soaking and recognize if... um, if you, if you wake up in the morning and you say, hey, I got Bible in a year and I'm reading through, I spend 10 minutes reading my Bible in a year, double it. Go to bed listening to it. Turn on, turn on, on his word and fall asleep listening to it. Like, just start to soak yourself. Start to soak yourself in his word. If you normally have the radio turned on at work, switch it to Christian music and just let him soak for a little while. Like, change the atmosphere of your home and the atmosphere of your life for four weeks. Just learn to abide in him. Learn, learn the art of imbibition, of, like, of finding truth, establishing truth, and just soaking in that truth. Like, if you normally come to church every three weeks, try every week for a season. <laughs> try it. Just try it. Just, just show up more. Be it with people more, be more regular, just like, it's like springtime. What we do is we open up the windows, we let the new air in, we move the couches, we clean everything around it. We'll do the same thing spiritually. Like spiritually, just, just step back and like open up your life, set a place and a presence in your home, turn on worship music, turn on the word, like let your kids also enjoy just, just a soaking area in your home. Like for four weeks, could you imagine, I wonder what kind of breakthrough we would all get if all of us over the next four weeks just started to like soak ourselves. Just soak ourselves. More word, more worship, more time with people, more time in his presence. Like if we just took an an actual season of time and we just soaked all of those things, I wonder what would happen. I wonder what kind of breakthrough that all of us would walk into and we'd feel. And um, Jesus heals a guy who's born blind it's a beautiful story. If you haven't been able to read it, he, he comes in and actually the guy's been bored blind. He walks up to him and prays over him. He heals them and the guy can see. So from birth has seen nothing to all of a sudden he's now an adult and can see clearly. And he's thoroughly enjoying now being able to see. And it's like his whole world has changed. Well, the Pharisees that are around him, I love this. They actually came over to him and they started to question him and ask him questions, stuff like this. And it says that in the Bible, it says that the Pharisees refused to believe, not that he was healed. They refused to believe that he was actually born blind. Sometimes that's our story. God will do a miracle right in front of your face. And instead of just appreciating it, you step back and say, well, maybe it wasn't, maybe they weren't fully sick. Maybe, they had, maybe something else would start. Maybe... And like the Pharisees, they had this hard shell around their heart that the moment God did anything, they questioned it because they had this doubt that was just like a hard shell holding them in. And they kept questioning him. In fact, they brought in his parents. After they questioned him, they brought in his parents just to confirm, are you sure he was born blind? And of course, his parents are like, what are you guys doing? Like, he was born blind. Yes, they're all testifying to it. So they finally pull him back in and they ask him, they say, they say what's your opinion on this guy? <laughs> the guy goes, I don't have an opinion. Like they're trying to call him a sinner and trying to, he says, I, I, I don't know if he's a sinner. I don't know who he is. He says, here's what I do know. I once was blind and now I see. That's a man who didn't have a hard shell around his heart. He just took it for what it was. And the hopes, as we go through this series, as we, as we walk through the next couple of weeks, that we'd actually get to a place where we're not trying to figure out how it happened. But we're just stepping back and saying, I don't know. I just know that before I was struggling. And now I feel like I'm in victory. Before I felt, I felt shamed and sinful and I couldn't get control of my habits and I couldn't get control of my mind and my thoughts. I couldn't get control of my finances. But all of a sudden now, I'm at a place where something's working. I can't explain it to you. I can't tell you exactly what broke it. I can't tell you when the moment was. I just know that I sat in the presence of God and in the presence of God, something miraculous happened. 
Our goal is to discover what it is that's holding us back, what it is that we're holding in unbelief, what it is that we're holding on in anger, to be able to just expose it, to find truth in his word, to be able to cut little holes and shove truth in it, and then just keep watering truth. Just keep it watering. When I was, when we were uh, married, maybe four years, Rachel and I, um, we decided that we were going to go ahead and have kids. Uh, at some point, I was no longer enough for my wife, so she needed kids. <laughs> That's how every man feels, just so we know that. And um, so we actually started trying. She wanted to have a baby. And so we started trying for babies. Seven months in, uh, every month she wasn't pregnant, she'd get discouraged. And every month she wasn't pregnant, I was like, I'm willing to keep trying. You know? <clears throat> trying seems just as good for me. So uh, I remember month after month, her heart just keeps getting broken. And, and I would start to anticipate it, you know? I'd start to anticipate it. And I think it was on month seven. It was either her or I, I don't know who it was. Probably her. She was reading in the Bible in Genesis 30:22. And although it was a word for somebody else, it was truth. And he said, God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and he opened up her womb. And I remember she wrote that out. In fact, for the first couple of years that Titus was born, we had it in his nursery up on the wall that God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and he opened her womb. And she, she wrote that out. She held that. And she just said, God, like, I, you know the desire of my heart. And you know what I'm experiencing and here's truth and I'm just gonna just sit in it and I'm gonna trust that you're better than everything and you know. It was within like a month she was pregnant with our first. And as you maybe know our story, we had to turn off the tap in order to stop, <laughs> to get everything to stop. Yeah. So the question is, as we hold on to it, are there areas in our life in which we recognize, oh, I'm so angry. I'm so angry and I'm angry at God and I'm angry at people. We recognize I'm just struggling with anxiety and there's no peace. Maybe you can't sleep. Maybe you sit up through the night and you think to yourself, what is happening? Why, God, what are you doing? Maybe you don't feel protected or loved or taken care of. Maybe you don't feel provided for. Maybe you think to yourself, I know that God desires to bless his people, but obviously not me. Like there are areas in our life that God wants to expose and he wants to bring a beautiful scripture. He wants to bring his word around it, pack it in. And then we actually have to be willing to just sit in his presence and sit in his word and sit with his people. But something spiritual happens when we can define the problem and we can hold truth and then we just sit and soak in him. If you would take, close your eyes, I just want to take a moment because we're here in his presence. We actually started this service with worship. We're back in a place of worship. You've spent the last hour of your life soaking in his presence. And I fully believe that he's already doing stuff in you and me. Maybe he's already exposed something in you. Would you be willing to even just let it be exposed in front of him? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not doing anything like that. To be able to acknowledge in your own heart and mind, God, I'm angry. God, I'm broken. God, I feel rejected. God, I feel unloved. Whatever it is you're going through and facing. And God, I'm willing to let that unbelief, pain, anger, experience just sit and soak in your presence for a little while. Lord, would you break off all the things in me and around me? Would you expose the doubt and soak it with truth? Psalm 4:8, in peace I lie down, for you are my protector. Maybe you just need to hold on to that. God, you'll protect me. You'll bring me peace as I sleep. The Bible says he grants sleep to those he loves. Sometimes you just got to remind him and yourself, uh, you love me. 
Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead in everything, tell God what you need and thank him. Maybe that's the piece you're missing. Maybe you're just complaining and you forgot to thank him for all you do have. Thank him for all he has done. It says, then you're going to experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that you can understand. Exodus 14, 14, the Lord himself will fight on your behalf. So just stay calm. Maybe you're in a battle of your life and you're thinking, I'm trying everything and I've thought of every angle and I've done everything I can. Maybe it's time just to sit. It's God, I trust you. And I'm going to trust you with what I'm facing. Isaiah 40, 31, those who hope in the Lord will have their strength renewed. Maybe you just need a hope for a little while. Let yourself hope. Maybe every time you step into hope, you think, nope, I won't do it. There's a season in my life where I stopped dreaming and I got so mad at God. I just remember thinking, I'm not going to pull another dream out of my heart so that you can smash it to pieces. And I choose to believe Revelation 3.20. He says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. For anyone who has a voice, hears my voice and opens their door, he says, I will come in, I will eat with them, and you will be with me. Sometimes we feel like God's running away from us. But I choose to believe that he's actually sitting at the door knocking, just waiting for me to open up the door. So open up the door. And Lord, we choose to abide in you, to just soak, to let your word go into our life. And it's simply enough to just sit in your presence. We don't have to have the right thing to say. We don't have to have the answer, but just to sit in your presence. Would you help us, even this week, to start to create these spaces for our family and in our homes, in our cars, in our workplaces, be able just to turn on the word or turn on worship and let it play through the night in our homes. Soak our kids. Soak our marriages. Soak our relationships. Man, if there's a scripture that you're believing and holding on to, just open it up at night. Leave it out in the living room. Turn on some worship music and say, God, would you fill this house? Fill my heart. I know you want to do a breakthrough and you want to do something amazing in me and I don't know my next step and I don't know what to do, but I do know. But if I can just sit in you and let you fill me and fill my heart, you will bring breakthrough for even the things we we stopped praying years ago. But God, we choose as a church to create a beautiful soil for your word, to create a place for it to sit and to open up and to break off the hard things and to create a root system to grow. The Bible says that our first step in relationship, creating a soil and preparing our hearts for his word to take root, is actually, it says we repent of our sin. In our pride, we set it down. We say, God, we're, for, we're sorry that our sin has created a separation. It says you repent of your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to make you right with God. That's the moment that you're forgiven. Then he wants to turn around. He actually wants to pursue relationship with you. He doesn't just want to free you. He wants to actually be connected to you. You've maybe heard it said before, Lord, would you be the Lord of my life? Would you come and live inside of my heart? I love it when you ask a kid in kids' church, where's God? I asked him to come and live inside of my heart. That's when it starts. Because he wants to take up residence in you. And then we need to create a place for him to continually fill and fill and fill. So Lord, we ask this week, would you fill our hearts with your presence? If you've never asked the Lord, you never repented of your sin, ask him to come and live in you right now. It's a good time. And in your own words, I just say, God, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I believe that you and your sacrifice was more than enough for me on the cross. And I want to be in relationship with you. And this week, 
as he comes and he lives inside of your heart, he can start the swelling of your heart. So God, this week we ask, would you swell our hearts? Would you fill our hearts and our minds and our lives with your presence? And would you bring breakthrough, break off doubt, break off anger, break off fear, break off discouragement, break off hopelessness, and fill our lives with your gospel fruit, with your presence. Do a, do a miracle in my life. In Jesus' name, amen.